I'm a trained geriatrician from WashU, which is a very excellent institution. And one of the things and one of the most important aspects of health, longevity, aging has been protein. And there was a lot of myths about dietary protein, none of which, by the way, have been validated. Observational data, epidemiology data does one thing. And typically, when we think about the hierarchy of evidence, we take epidemiology and then we do randomized control human trials. And what we know is that based on the randomized control human trials, that now the RDA is 0.8 grams per kilogram, which is the bare minimum of protein per day. So that is the bare minimum set to prevent deficiencies. It is not the maximum. And I would just like to bring up this example of vitamin C. Vitamin C, do you know the RDA of vitamin C? I don't know. 60, 60 milligrams, very, very low. Now, if you were getting sick or you needed an extra boost, would you hesitate to take more vitamin C? Not at all. In fact, you would be like, meh, I'm not feeling great. Maybe I'll take some vitamin C, right? Well, the RDA there is clearly that it's 60 milligrams to prevent deficiencies, but most people, nearly everybody, would be willing to say that is not a maximum. Yet when we look at dietary protein that's set at 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, people say, no, 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 that's the maximum. I am using this example to highlight the huge dichotomy that we have between nutrients and then this macronutrient protein, which is arguably the elephant in the room, right? It is the black sheep of the macronutrient family. The data would support that nearly double that is what is more optimal. In human randomized control trials, we know that optimizing for protein, those people always do better. They have better body composition. They have healthier lean muscle mass. They have better insulin and glucose control. These are very important measurable outcomes that we know. We also know that it improves satiation and it protects tissue. And in fact, the body, there's protein turnover that happens about 300 grams a day. We have to account for that. And not only that, but protein is essential. And there's never any evidence, there has not been to my knowledge, nor in the literature to support higher levels of dietary protein having any kind of negative effect, yeah. ever. Ever, but epidemiology, it's really interesting. So if you look at the relative risk, so the relative risk is what we consider in medicine when it is two or, or above two, we consider it clinically significant. So we'll say smoking and lung cancer, the relative risk would be 12, okay? And this is just based on the data. So they have looked at protein and the relative risk of protein intake and any kind of illness is 1.2. So according to the evidence, it's not clinically significant. And I'm really glad you bring up this point because the evidence doesn't support the narrative. And I will say that if you look at the history, people have been arguing about nutrition and nutrition science forever, since the 1800s. And when I think of the word food, what do you think of when you think of food? You might have a different uh, perspective because you are very involved in the world of food. But when you think of food, what do you think? First thing. Uh, food, I see like abundance, like a farmer's market type of yeah, feel. Yeah, okay. Like a lot of like mm -hmm. you know, bright, colorful things that sort of draw you in. Do you think about emotion and family and community, which I know is big, and even comfort, right? A lot yeah. of women. But you don't necessarily think of, off the top of your head, the biochemical nutrient processes of mm -hmm. the hard science of food. So we have food, which is emotional. It's my grandmother's cookies. It's the holidays. It's I'm feeling stressed. I'm going to eat. Food is so much more. And then you have the science aspect. So the science is hypotheses that can be tested, a body of literature that can be learned upon. It can be tested and tested over again. So we have food science as the ultimate oxymoron. I'm bringing this up to set the stage for the confusion around food. 
Nobody argues about calculus. Nobody even argues about biochemistry. Yet here we have a hard science, which is a food science, and we are all arguing about it. That is unusual for any avenue of a hard science. Is it because also just like nutritional studies that especially have anything to do with longevity are like tough to do in a like a human level and following people over that period of time? Is that part of this? I don't think so. I think it's from biases. I think that food, even of a scientist perspective, I think it can be very clouded. I think that evidence is evidence and there's half a century of data to support higher protein diets for humans, yet there's still more epidemiology, there's still bad press about protein. And I don't believe that it's based on confusion because again, there are many human randomized control trials that support dietary protein. And I wasn't even aware. So I've been mentored by one of the world leading protein scientists. His name is Dr. Donald Lehman. And um, he's mentored me for two decades. I worked when I was in my undergrad in some of the early human studies. And at that time, it wasn't such a hot topic in terms of argument. But, you know, it's really interesting as I'm writing my book, I'm looking back at the literature and World War II, uh, during the rationing times, there were recommendations. And the recommendations for protein, are you ready for what those were? The yes. soldiers were given at least one pound of meat a day. An injured soldier, and this is from literature in the 1940, I think 1945, an injured soldier was given 250 grams of protein. And what the records are showing and what was reported was that they had a 50% increase in their healing capacity. And this is before all the um, kind of narrative and fighting. This is just what they were doing. And back on home soil, people were encouraged to grow victory gardens. All the high quality protein was sent overseas. They had to feed a million people. They were encouraged to eat grains. They were given and rationed one egg a day. They were eating processed foods, more processed foods, more grains. And there was an acknowledgement that this protein was so valuable that we were gonna send it all overseas. Fast forward 80 years later to now what we're seeing, we're seeing the same kind of narrative wrapped up differently. We are hearing protein is bad for longevity, protein is bad for the planet, or it's bad for your health. We should eat more grains. We should be more vegetarian. And what I think is really interesting is that the same recommendations are happening with a new narrative. And what I feel is most important is that we all want a healthy world, all of us, you, me, all the work that you do. And in order to have a healthy world, we must have transparent conversations. And that is what is missing. Hmm. You know, last time we chatted, I had a big aha moment from something mm. that you shared. And I just want to add this into the mix. Yeah. Uh, because you're not out here, like, first of all, like, you just want people to be healthy. You're not trying to tell people what to do. Absolutely right? not. And you're trying to show them that, hey, look, if something isn't working and you don't feel like your best, yeah. or if you care about this topic of longevity, here's a crucial conversation that you might be missing out. Right. right? One of the things you mentioned last time is I was telling you that I come from uh, you know, growing up, I was vegetarian. Yeah. And on my both my mom and dad's side of the family, there's a long history of you know vegetarianism or vegetarians. Mm. And especially for my mom's, it's probably one of the longest. Uh, and everybody in my podcast knows I'm not vegetarian now. Uh, and by the way, I used to be vegetarian. Yeah, we'd love to talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk, talk yeah. to you about that. Have a few questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, my mom's side, the Jane tradition, J A I N. Mm. Yep, of course. One of the longest. Yes. Uh, yes. Continuously running yes. group of vegetarians that mm -hmm. are there. And um, I was sharing with you that, you know, when I go to India and I'll spend time, you know, these pockets, because India is struggling mm -hmm. with major outbreaks of metabolic health issues. Right. It's like something crazy. Like it's uh, India is only 18% of the population in the world, but they have almost like 40% of all the heart attacks right. in the world. It's like nuts, yeah. right? The metabolic health is going nuts. But when I see um, 
people who are older in these pockets and I go and visit or I go to the rural areas right. and I see older individuals that are there, uh, you know, and often people who are maybe still farmers or things like that, they're they're very lean, okay, but they're shredded, uh-huh. right? Like yeah. they're lean, like yeah. they don't have bellies and other things like that. And they're not eating protein, like on in animal protein at all. Right. And I was asking you about that and you were like, look, one thing that's important for you, and let's see if I got it right and then yeah. correct me if I got okay. it wrong and build on it. She's so like, one thing important to understand is that the more you work out, yes. the less protein you need, right? So if there's people that, all day are out in the sun, yeah. working all the time. They're moving doing, their muscle. Move, yeah. Moving their muscle. Yeah. They're going to have shredded muscle, mm-hmm. right? And they're constantly moving their body. And maybe their protein requirement is different. Now, if you have other people that are not in that space. Which most people are not. Most right? people are not. Most people are not. And then the other next question I would say is, what then becomes optimal? Right. So, But that was just interesting yeah. for me to hear yeah. because it was putting into context yeah. that I was like, okay, wait, why is it working for this one group? Even yeah. though this is anecdotal evidence, I haven't right. put a whole population set together. Yeah. These could be just outliers that are part of it. It's like, what is going on with them? And again, like you said, most people are not in that situation right. where they're working their body out, you know, eight to 16 hours a day. Right. You know, and I would say I probably would mention that number one, calories matter, and then also the repair and recovery of their bodies. So do they need less protein? They certainly could get away with less because they're moving and they're keeping their muscle healthy and subtle and supple. Um, and again, the question would be, would it be optimal? And this is a beautiful segue to say one of the things that happens with aging muscle is, again, muscle as an organ is a nutrient sensor. And when we think about a practical, from a practical standpoint, you know, if you are going to eat for longevity. And that's also something we should define Yeah. in terms of what actually is longevity. Sure. Is it six weeks, six months, six hours? I think it's a very nebulous term. I would even argue that it's not about the length of time you live. You know, I, I worked in a nursing home for two years. That is not a pretty picture. We have become very capable and able to keep people alive for periods of time that Um, there's quite a bit of suffering that happens. I would argue it's the quality of life and the strength. The health span. Exactly. And if we reduce dietary protein during the time in which you have the most capacity to build it, in your 30s, 40s, this is the time where you build tissue. If those individuals decide that they are going to go on a lower protein diet, and not really train, it doesn't get easier to build muscle. In your 50s and 60s, it's more difficult. And we really have to think, what are the health outcomes that we're looking at? And I would argue, while there's nebulous outcomes, there are very clear outcomes, like you mentioned grip strength, like you mentioned physical strength, like you mentioned you know, being able to be metabolically healthy. And the other thing that we know is the more healthy muscle you have, that is your amino acid reserve. If a person were to get injured, the thing that is going to save them is their muscle. Individuals that get cancer, 50 to 80% are going to get cachexia. That is a muscle wasting. The survivability of those individuals is going to be based on their skeletal muscle. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. Whole grain bread in the supermarket is not whole grain because the grains have been pulverized to smithereens. All right?